Does this mean they endorsed everything that I believe in? Not really. It, it really doesn't work that way. But it means that I was able to present them in such a way, vote on principle, and still be accepted uh, by the people. And it wasn't like they didn't know what I was doing. They were very much aware of it. And uh, in America, the use of the word libertarian is questionable, less questionable now than it used to be. But now they'll just say, well, if they label you libertarian, they're more likely to think, oh, they're libertine. You know, it's just to allow people to have lifestyles that otherwise they couldn't have, rather than defending liberty in a very, in a very personal way. So this, uh, this to me was uh, very encouraging, and I thought, well, I would, uh, I would pursue this uh, the, the best I could. Now, I want to, uh, this is also in the booklet, I do want to start with a quote uh, from Mises uh, uh, dealing with this. Mises says, under the predominance of interventionist ideas, a political career is open only to men who identify themselves with the interests of a pressure group. And I thought, well, as much respect as I have for Mises, and I know he speaks the truth and he has most of the answers, I would like to prove him wrong, because he was being a pessimist there. There is no career for those who do not succumb to the pressure group. Now, subsequently I had the elections and I've been re-elected, but I would have to be honest with you that this type of a political career that I have, the rewards are different than they are ordinarily uh, for other politicians because you cannot move up the political ladder if you aren't within the establishment. So the achievement has to be limited to that of presenting the views to the people and letting them know what it is and let them endorse it by a vote without the expectation that I will become a very, very powerful committee chairman that will be able to get the money and the projects and the benefits back to the district. Quite to the contrary, they have to vote for me in spite of it because uh, it becomes more difficult. If you vote against all the appropriation bills, why would they put anything in, your, in the budget for your district? And Republican or Democrat, either party, would try deliberately to send that point and try to undermine what I'm doing by excluding uh, those benefits. But fortunately, uh, I think that uh, the people will respond. I think the people will respond throughout the world if they're presented with the truth. Today there's a starvation in our country for hearing the straight truth and the talk and an honest answer, and people will say, I don't agree with Ron Paul all the time, but at least I know where he stands and he tells us the truth. And they, they, they also know that we face problems. We face economic problems. They know there are flaws in our foreign policy. And they know that the government is becoming more intrusive every day. So they like that part of it. For instance, uh, some of the political challenges have been, speci specifically, up until recently, my district was basically agriculture. I didn't have any of the big cities. I had 22 farm countries, counties. And uh, the farm organization, the farm bureaus, the cattlemen's association, all are for government programs. You know, subsidies and protection and whatever. So they always opposed my reelection. I would come, if this were a group of farmers, I would tell them, I oppose all farm subsidies, and I won't vote for farm subsidies. But then I tell them what I believe in. In our country, the Second Amendment is pretty important. That means farmers like to be able to defend themselves and own a weapon. They like to be left alone. They don't want the federal government regulators coming in and tell them how to use their land. They don't like abusive uh, inheritance taxes. So there were a lot of issues that they instinctly identified with me. And ultimately, I think the clinching argument that I had with the farmers uh, was that, how long have we had this system of subsidies to the farmers? Since the Depression, 70, 80 years. I said, how rich are you? 
oh, we're all poor. We're poor family farmers. We're starving. I said, but how rich are the corporate agribusiness groups, the big corporations? Oh, they're rich. They got all the subsidies. So then they say, well, maybe it isn't working that well. And I was able to neutralize that, not by saying, well, I'm going to be for the free market every place except for the farmers. I'll vote for the free market for everybody else, but for my farmers, I have to vote for the free market. I mean, for the subsidies. Since I could not do that, my job had to be to convince them that they would not lose that much. And fortunately, uh, that, that did work. And uh, another, uh, now I have more of a coastal area. Uh, we're right, we live right on the Gulf Coast. Uh, the hurricanes narrowly missed us last year. And believe me, we watch weather reports closely, especially in the summertime, about where these storms are coming. So what does the federal government have uh, that supports the people on the Gulf Coast? Well, it's what they call the flood insurance. The marketplace won't provide insurance. I have a house that faces the Gulf. It, right now, because the government has taken over, there's no private insurance, so you can't go out and buy it. If the market handled it, you either wouldn't get insurance or you would pay a lot more for it. The market's telling us it's risky living on the Gulf Coast. But no, years, 20, 30 years ago, they started flood insurance, so the government, the federal government, subsidizes those of us who want to live in a dangerous area, and lo and behold, a lot of people live in these dangerous areas. Our house gets blown down, the government pays for it. Well, my position on federal flood insurance is they shouldn't do it. That you shouldn't have flood insurance because it's bad economics, it's unfair to the um, people in uh, Arizona to pay for the hurricanes in Texas. And, uh, and, and yet, that one is a tough one, but they know up front that I don't vote uh, for the flood insurance, and yet it's very challenging. Getting infrastructure rebuilding is a little bit more difficult because uh, they do take a lot of money from us from the federal government. So the way I handle that and work with it is if there is a grant or an ongoing program, uh, I try to make that program work with the idea that I'm trying to get the money back that they have already taken from us, but I generally would vote against those programs believing for two reasons, bad economic policy, bad moral policy, as well as the fact that our Constitution is very restrictive in what the federal government should do. Fortunately for me, uh, though what I do is controversial to a large degree, uh, I can use the argument of the Constitution. Our Constitution is very small and it's very, uh, very straightforward. And uh, there's uh, the doctrine of enumerated powers gives uh, the Congress 18 things they're allowed to do. Today we do 1,800, if not 18,000 things that we shouldn't be doing. But in the United States, there's still a lot of respect for the Constitution. So if you say, well, I voted against the flood insurance, and uh, I realize the difficulty that you might have because you don't immediately have that, but I'm following my pledge, my oath of office, to obey the Constitution. I believe in the rule of law, and therefore I am not going to vote uh, for that. They will give you enough respect and give you a pass on that. That is easier than if you would vote against it and you had this authority. If you had only voted against it, say for economic reasons, it would be different. Uh, they have a little more difficulty in understanding uh, the, the economics of, of it all. But uh, these kind of programs are the kind of things I, that I would face on a, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. And, uh, and yet, fortunately for me and what I'm trying to do, we've been able to, uh, to overcome that. But uh, Mises uh, had always had these explanations for me. Of course, uh, the two that I think he helped me most on uh, had to do with uh, the business cycle theory, the theory of how to explain the business cycle, as well as the subjective theory of value. And uh, these are poorly understood in Washington, poorly understood generally in America, that uh, they, they either don't accept it or they don't understand it or, or, they, don't, uh, or they don't want to. 
But uh, on monetary policy, those were, that was the interest that I had in the 1970s when I was first elected, when uh, the Austrian economists predicted the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system. It did break down. We had the prices rising, and we had all the problems. So that was a confirmation. And I am a true believer. That's why uh, I am very impressed and very pleased that we have central bankers here. This is, this is pretty nice that uh, central bankers would come with an open mind to listen to us uh, who talk about uh, the lack of a need uh, for, for central banking. And uh, at, the, um, at the same time, uh, this is so necessary to understand uh, the business cycle.